Hello once again and welcome to the Amalgamated with Christ Church where the purpose statement remains the same to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And so yes, we give God thanks once more that we have an opportunity to stand here to study His Word. We are seeing many things happening today and um, some of these things that we see happening especially with Christians is the fact that we're ignorant of many things that the scripture have to say. So, I don't remember if I was having a conversation or what this was, but it's like um, the question or the argument now is, do Christians sin? So, do Christians sin? Very important question because the Bible say one thing, but yet still you have many conflicting um, arguments some people are biased because they want to put their own point across and some people are biased because they want to do what they want to do but the scripture has an answer for everything but you just got to search the scripture very diligently and allow the revelation through the holy spirit to speak to you first we should understand that a christian is not just any and any old man a christian is someone that has been made new a christian is a daring follower of jesus christ one who is educated in the things of of god and one who goes all the way in terms of following they don't divert if they turn back then they're backsliding so the question is that do Christians sin? So I said first we must clearly define who is a Christian. The term Christian was mentioned first in the Bible in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. And um, it was in Antioch. And so scripture says here, And when... He had found him, he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christians. Christians is similar to um, that um, of a member of a great household who were slaves. They follow carefully the directions and the teaching of their masters and so those people who were following the teaching of Christ those people who gather in the church they say no wait a minute they're acting as if they're following so they call them Christians because they were following after Christ and Christ Jesus Christ was the teacher he's the master and so a Christian then is one that I would go out to say is he indoctrinated in the way of Christ he relies on the Holy Spirit to reveal to him the things that Jesus Christ had previously taught the disciples because um, that's what Christians do we rely on the only source now the question as I said was um, do Christians sin so we define who is a Christian and uh, now we got to define sin. Sin is an action or rebellion against God. In other words, this can be through your very thought process, your very deed. Some people do not think they have, to, they have to do things to go against God. But I say that in your very thought process, if it goes against God, it's rebellion against God because it goes against the law or the character of God. So, sin can be summed up as anything that goes against righteousness and holiness. Because the scripture made it clear, be holy for the Lord is holy. And so if God is holy, if thing goes against holiness, it's going against the character of God. So anything that goes against the character of God, lies, stealing, um, covetousness, murder, anything, drunkenness, um, fornication, anything that goes against that which is holy is considered sin. So we've defined Christians and we've defined sin. 
Now, sin entered into the world, entered into the world, because when the world was created, when mankind was created, if you go back to the beginning in Genesis 1 to 2, you see where God created the heaven and the earth, and God created mankind. And at the end of all of God's creation, everything was very, very good. God said it was good because there was no sin. Then here comes Genesis chapter 3, when you have the fall of man, came through deception. The Satan, the dragon, the evil one presented himself, took on the persona of the snake, and he, he deceived the woman. Deceived the woman who was right there in the garden. Her husband was somewhere about because she presented to him the forbidden fruit, and he did eat of it. So the scripture says that sin entered into this world through one man. Ironically, people like to say, oh, it is the woman who, who picked the fruit. It is the woman who presented the fruit. But if the scripture is saying that <clears throat> um, in the order of things, you have God and Jesus Christ, and then you have the man, and then you have the woman. So therefore, if the man was following after Christ, and the woman is following after the man, then guess what? The man is to be blamed. Because he was not leading correctly. So the scripture says right here in Romans chapter um, 5 verse 4. Therefore just as to one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So the entire world was created. It was a perfect world. It was a perfect world. And then sin entered in, contaminated everything. So now you have the fall of man. The fall of man occur. And because we are all descendants of that one man, that couple, Adam and Eve, all the way back in the beginning, guess what? We have the DNA of sin within us. What do you mean? I mean now we have a sin nature. It's part of us. It's part of our makeup. That is the reason a baby is born. You don't have to teach a baby how to do anything that is wrong. It's just in them. It's just in the child. There is no child that has been um, born into this world that has been perfect. No, not one. No man, no woman, no one in this world. You say, well, I've never killed, I've never cheated, I've never done anything. Anything that goes against society. We don't know what's in your thought process. We don't know what's in you. So we have the DNA of sin within us. Otherwise... The sin nature or the flesh is still within us. It's still a part of us. And because it is a part of us, none of us has to be educated in the order of, in, the, in, in terms of how to sin. It's natural. It's like riding a bike, some would say. And so therefore, I said that you were born into this world, but no one teach you how to sin. What the scripture does teach us, though, is that we should train up a child, Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go. Why should we train up the child in the way how the child should go? Because we have the sin nature, and as the child grow up, if the child is not taught the things of righteousness, taught the character of God, the child is going to go astray. So anyone that is not taught the character of God, holiness, righteousness, they're going to go astray. You're saying, what do you mean? It says right here, same Proverbs 22 and 15, it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. In other words, the depravity is evidence in all of us. What do I mean? I mean the things that go against God, the sin nature, the flesh, it's in all. All of us. So none of us is none of us. Um, we none of us. We are good enough. We're not good enough. So we look at who is a Christian. We look at sin, and we see how sin came into the world, and now we see that sin is a part of each and every one of us. Now you're born as a little baby, tiny, tiny baby. You don't know anything. You're not going to do anything. The little baby, the little baby lying down on the bed is not going to do anything. But as that child grow, as the child mature, 
the child starts to do things and so many times the child is prone to foolish acts. Foolish deeds are things that is not satisfactory. Because it's foolish. It hurts people. Foolishness hurt people. Foolishness, foolishness goes against things that is sensible, so to speak. So then, as we also grow, guess what? Our sin nature also mature in us. Note, the more we grow, the more we, the older we get, the more liberty we have. So when we were growing, our children, I mean, our parents could say, don't do this, don't do that. And we have to, most of us have to abide by that rule. But as we grow up, we get independent and we start to do what we want to do. So as a man grow, people start to think about other things. The scripture says in Romans chapter 1 that man has now um, invented ways of doing wickedness. So you see, we grow up and we outgrow some of the wickedness. If you want to say, no wickedness is innocent, but if you want to, if you want to just um, point at it and say, you all grow the little thing of taking a cookie out of the cookie jar. So now, now, you, now, now we, see people, we see people doing um, those sort of schemes that you're across the road and they're across the road from you. And they can um, log into your cell phone or whatever it is and steal all the money from out of your bank. We see people stealing identity. We see people doing all those things. We see people living here, but yet still, there's a report that they're buying stuff all the way across the world because someone has stealing their identity. So man has matured into terms of in the heart of sinning. And the funny thing is now, as we grow and we perform these deeds, other type of deeds that's also against the character of God are welcomed by society. For example, it's okay if you stay in your house and lock up in your house and you're drunk and you do whatever you want to do in your house, as long as you don't go and drive around or beat up someone or do something. You're free to drink and sleep and do what and nobody will arrest you. You can go out on the street and you can lie and people know that you're lying. Even politicians lie to the public and people embrace it. You can live with two women People embrace, you can live with three. And people say, ooh, that's a, that's a man. And in some society, you can do everything you want. You can marry the same sex and society, accept it. Accept it. So some of us in society, we embrace some of the sinful deeds, but it still goes against the character of God. Now, we're under no obligation to do the things to do the things, to do the, we're under no obligation, I should say, because as we grow and we're doing things that is, that is against the character of God, our heart turns wax cold. The, the more you go in, the more you, the more you, you dig into depravity, is the more your heart gets wax cold. And, it's the, and the more you feel that you're under no obligation to deprive yourself of loss. To deprive yourself of things of the flesh because your flesh gratifies and your flesh love the things the things that the, will suit the flesh and in galatians chapter 5 a lot of these things as mentioned in galatians chapter 5 19 right down to 21 we see that society embraces them for example if you look in it you see adultery fornication society eh, engage them lewdness yeah, people on television now, they're lewd, idolatry. We see those sort of people worshiping all sort of things, doing everything, and, and nobody, you know, revelry, all these things, envy. Only some of these things society may penalize. Murder, junk driving, etc., etc. But I tell you what, the sinful nature grows and matures with us. But do Christians sin? We're going to get to that. It comes a time comes a time when suddenly some of us will go back to what we know in terms of the training that we get when we were growing up. Training up in the, in the things of God. We grew up, we rejected it, some of us returned to it, some of us never really reject it, but we still had the sin nature in us. So what do we have to do to overcome this sin nature? We repent. 
We repent. And when we repent, we're supposed to be done with things of the flesh, so to speak. We've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We have, we have turned over a new page. We have turned over a new page. Now we are children of the light. Now we are children of God. And so now we embrace righteousness and holiness. And when we embrace righteousness and holiness, it means then now we are eating the flesh of Christ and drinking his blood because his DNA is now within us. And if his DNA is within us, something remarkable should happen. And that is no more conformity to the world. Scripture says in Romans 12 verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So now then. The time come and we repent. We take on the persona of a Christian. We have a new identity. We are, a, we are, we are now Christians. And so, we are no longer conforming to the way of this world. Our mindset is renewed. But, because we are always growing mentally and physically, we have to continue to feed our mind because it's a process. The more you live, the more you have to feed your mind because the more transformation takes place. Note this very carefully. When you stop fellowshipping, when you stop feeding your mind, you are stagnant. You have to continuously feed your mind. Do not be conformed, the scriptures are about, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. If your mind is not renewed, you will not be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will do things that seem right. And the scripture said that things may seem right unto a man. Seem right, but the hand therein leads to death. Why? Because it's not good. It seems good. It appears to be good. It is a camouflage situation. And so then, we have the DNA of sin within us. And the renewing process is like you taking medication. You're taking a medication to keep you healthy. The word of God is health. The word of God is source of life. You have to continue to feed yourself on that as a child of God. Why? Because sin is still within us. But when we feed and we renew our mind, we keep it, we keep it at bay. Why? Because feeding your mind and the things of God will allow you to draw closer to God. That the scripture say, you draw close to him, he draws close to you. When you draw close to God, guess what? The devil flee because you'll be able to resist the devil. But if there is no renewing of the mind, if there is no drawing close, if there is no feeding of the mind, the devil is not going nowhere. The devil is going to stay right there with you. So some people think that... Some people think that, some people think that, um, um, okay, okay, I don't need to go to church every day. I don't need to do this. <clears throat> I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to do that. But that's not what the scripture is saying. I don't have the fellowship. The scripture tells you that it is good to fellowship because you overcome the deeds, you overcome the dragon, paraphrasing, by the word of the testimony. Iron sharpens iron. You see each other, you feel good. You share and you read the scripture together. You pray together. You worship together. You, you give a testimony. As a matter of fact, that's what the church is supposed to do. That's the whole job of church. The scripture says in Acts 2 and 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. When you continue steadfastly in the doctrine and fellowship, you will continue to renew your mind. Why is that so important to continue to fellowship and to renew our mind? You say, okay then, 
I am a Christian now because remember, we define Christians, we define sin, and we say sin came into the world, and we say that we repent of our sin, and we say that now we are being transformed or we are feeding our mind. So you're saying, preacher, so why is it necessary for me to continue this process? Because you are still alive, and the more you are alive, guess what? The more your sin nature grows along with you. It grows along with you. It grows along with you. And so the scripture tells you in Romans chapter 7 verse 1. I find then a law that is evil present with me. The one will do good for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Listen to this. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Okay listen. I find then a law, I find that, I find then a practice that is evil, present with me, right? It's present with me. The one will do good for I delight in the law of God, the inward man, according to the inward man, the spiritual man. What is he saying? You want to do the things that is good, but there is a conflict. There is a Conflict because the sin nature is still within us. It is still within us. And that's the reason it says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. If there's no subjection to your sinful nature, guess what? You're going to fall. So the question is, do Christians sin? I say yes. He said, what? I didn't know that. Are you sure? I say yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Christians do sin. But as a Christian, you should not willfully sin. Some of us may say, since I've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I've never sinned. Some of you will say, I am, I, I, I've never sinned since I am born. I'm always good. That is not so. Not one of us is without sin. Not one of us. What we are as a child of God is we are dead to sin. Meaning sin does not control the true Christian. So do Christians sin? Yes. But do Christians willfully sin? No, they are not. Yes, and you're going to find some scripture. Show. Yes. Scripture says in 1 John chapter um, 1 verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So you can go around and say that you don't sin. The truth is not in you. That's the reason the scripture tells us that we should not conform, but transform by the renewing of your mind. It is a process. But the religious folk may say, but that's nonsense. You're going against the scripture. If you say that we, we have no sin. This is John. He's writing to believers. He said, if we say we have have no sin. We deceive. The enemy would want you to believe that you have no sin. The enemy would want you to believe that you don't sin. But at the same time, you murmur against someone that is in, in, your, in, in your household. Murmur against your husband. Murmur against your wife. Murmur against your parents. Murmur against someone in church. Give them a bad eye in church. Look at them bad. Wishing they could stop earlier so you could go home to do things that is not of God. But we don't count those little things. We don't see those little things. So we claim we don't see. We like to look at the big sin. Oh yeah, he's an homosexual. Oh, oh yeah, he, he commits adultery. Oh yeah, he's a thief. Oh yeah, can you believe it? He was a murderer. Oh, he went to prison. Oh, 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 yeah. He, 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 he claimed that he's baptized, but mm, I don't trust him. But there you are in your heart, failing to pick the big plank in your eye that's blocking your view. So, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. And the truth of God is not in you. And the scripture make it very clearly, carefully known to us that we should remove the plank or the beam that's within our eye before we attempt to pull the speck out of the other eye. 
Now you're saying you have no sin, but yet still the scripture said the spiritual man judges all things and he himself is not rightly judged by anyone except by another spiritual man. Why is that so? Because each of us, each and every one of us have the DNA of sin within us. Now I say that we do sin, but we do not willfully and should not willfully sin. This is the deal, this is the beauty about it. If you fall, or when you fall, sometimes we fall within our mind. Sometimes we fall within our heart. But no one can see when we fall, but God see it. It is evident to him. It is evident to him. Evident to him. Now, and this is the beauty. This is the beauty about God. He made everything clear. Everything is clear. It's laid out so no man can say, oh, you do this and I do that and, and you do that. But God is judging you. He knows the heart. Who knows the depths of the heart? The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. From the heart springs what? The issues of life. The issues of life. So how then you're going to say you have never sinned, you don't sin, but yet still the scripture is saying that if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth of God is not in you. It's not in you. I say then, if you fall, if you fall, you can get up. And that is the reason sin has no control over us, because we shall get up when we fall down. Scripture says right here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why is that necessary? Remember I say that sin is against the character of God. And I say that it is righteousness and holiness. That's what we're looking at. Righteousness, God is just, God is faithful, God is kind. All those are character of God. But we are looking at righteousness and holiness. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. So those of you who are saying, or those of us who are saying we do not have any sin, it's time for us to repent. Time for us to confess. Time for you and I, if needs be, to work out our salvation daily with fear and trembling. Is that a slam dunk thing? We all have the DNA of sin within us. And chances are, some of us may have fallen into some, quote unquote, big sin. Some of us, some tiny sin. Some of you may be doing some sins that no one can see. You live the perfect life, you have the perfect marriage, you live in the perfect house, you're a deacon in the church, or you're the preacher. When you're going out, you're squeaky clean, your tax return is squeaky clean, everything about you is squeaky clean. They can't even find a parking ticket on you. But when God search the pages of your heart, guess what? Right? Ooh, what? That's a little blemish of sin right there. What is it doing in there? Rid yourself of all unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means you are to repent. If you do not repent, then sin controls you and you are not a Christian. Because a Christian is supposed to be educated in the things of Christ. A Christian is supposed to rely on the Holy Spirit to remind him or her of the teaching of Christ. But if you say that you have no sin, then you belong to the world. Because sin is controlling you. What you should say is that you do not willfully and are purpose it in your heart to go out there and sin. The scripture says be angry and sin not. Why is that necessary? Because anger is a natural part of your emotion. I did that because that's an emotional outburst. But if I do that emotional outburst, and then there's something else been behind that, the cursing and the glaring and all of that behind that, even within my heart, guess what? I'm sinning. Some of us may be smiling and sitting. No, don't worry about it. Take it. 
Take it. Oh, it's okay. Take the last cookie that I have. Don't worry about it. Oh, I hate this man. Why did he come now? That's what your heart is saying. That's what your heart is saying. So many times you see people going around professing to be holy, professing to be so righteous, professing to do everything. They point fingers. They want to stone homosexuals to death. They want to crucify the drunkards. They want to put to shame people who wear skimpy clothes. They want to tell you off. They want to hit you over the head with the Bible. They want to shake you in the head. They want you to tarry. They want you to speak in tongues. They want you to do all of that and deep within their heart. Deep within their heart. Shaking the sister in her head. Tell her to tarry. She looks good. Better than my wife. <laughs> Nasty man you. That's the reason Christ made it clear. That even the matter when he was speaking about divorce. Is a matter of the heart. Matter of the heart. Sexual immorality. Is not just in doing. It's in thinking. So a man Think in his heart, so is he. So those of you who are fortunate enough, fortunate enough, you say, I, I've never done such a thing. Indeed, but in your heart, how many times have you done it in your heart? Because no one can see what's in your heart. You do it every day. Every day. Every day when you're locked in the privacy of your home, you're doing it. What's on your computer? What are you looking at when you're scrolling through social media? Ooh, some of you are even on the dark web. Then you come and you present a, a facade of holiness. But a true Christian don't do none of those things. A true Christian do not willfully sin. Therefore, it is always necessary for a true Christian to identify with Jesus Christ. Identify with Jesus Christ, meaning you're a daring follower, you're a supporter, you're a champion of the faith. Because he's the only way. You don't rely on self. Oh, I think this is the way to do it. Oh, I think, oh, what you think? It's not what you think, it's what is written. The scripture don't care about what you think. So you think. Everybody thinks a different way. There was this old um, colloquial proverb. When I say proverb, I don't want some people to think I'm talking from the Bible. A proverb is a saying. Seven brothers, seven different minds. So seven of them think differently about the one scripture. They're going to give you several different interpretations. But prophecy is not subjected to any personal interpretation. Our man is going to tell you how we think. Oh, that is, oh that's a whole time thing, man. That don't, don't, I got a new revelation. There's no more new revelation. The prophets come. The prophets have received the word from God. The prophets have tell you what the word says. So you rely on what is written. Romans 15 verse 4. For whatever things were written before time or written in the past was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of this scripture might have hope. What am I saying? Sometimes you may be in a situation where you fall into sin. You fall from, uh, I mean, fall over. Fall over. You trip up. You trip up. And when you trip up, people want to criticize you. But don't worry. The most important thing is that you get up. Because the scripture is going to give you that comfort. If that was the case, Moses trip up. Moses trip up. David trip up. Peter trip up. Many men in the scripture tripped up. Some tripped and some fell. Some never got up. But the champions of the faith rise up. They rise up. And God don't hold it against them because a true Christian do not willfully sin. Therefore, those of us who remain in Christ should not actively engage in this, in this detestable act, this thing that is called sin. 
But that does not mean that you are excluded because you have the DNA within you. You have the DNA within you. Once you are alive, it is in us. Once we are alive and we are followers of Jesus Christ, we abide in him. 1 John 3, verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sin has neither seen him nor know him. I'm going to explain that. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness, remember we talk about the character of God, is righteous just as he is as he as he is righteous. He who sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. You're saying it's uncontradictory. No, it's not. We'll explain it. Continue, for this purpose the Son of God has manifested that he might destroy the works of evil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. You're saying, but how come people baptize? Why do the Christians sin? We get into that. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. You're saying, but preacher, that goes against everything because you're saying Christians, do Christians sin? They're saying, yeah, no, listen to this now. Whoever abides in him, I tell you that once you're renewing your mind, you have to live in him, right? Whoever sins, meaning whoever continues to sin, that's what it means. Whoever continues to sin has neither known him, right? Seeing him or knowing him. So if you say you're a child of God and you continue to sin, this is saying you don't know Christ. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteous, who abides in him. Just as he is righteous. He who sins, meaning does not, does what is sinful. That's what it's saying. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because he's a willful sinner. He's a willful sinner because he practices sin. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, meaning does not willfully sin. That's what the scripture is saying. For his seeds remain in him and he cannot sin. You cannot go out if you say that you are a true child of God and get down and decide that you're going to really, really sin. Some of us may be deceived and the moment you, you fall down that path, fall down that trap, you should repent because you belong to him because the seed of righteousness is implanted within you. So don't be beaten down if you carefully plan your rendezvous. And then suddenly you realize you have done wrong and you repent. The travesty is if you stay in that situation. That's what the travesty is. We do not practice sin. And so our life must not reflect sin. That's exactly what this is saying. Verse 7 is very important. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Verse 8. He who does what is sinful or willfully sin, that's what it is saying. So do Christians sin? Yeah, but do not willfully sin. Because we're of God, we cannot and we should not willfully practice sin. Because such a desire must not be in us. The desire to sin shouldn't be in us. You may fall... You may fall. David fell. Moses fell in, in anger. Even Peter lied. Well, he did not do it willfully. They did not desire to do so. And that's the reason the detail of their repentance was so carefully laid out. Carefully laid out. So don't let people... Try to deceive you. Colossians 2, 13. Listen to this. And you being dead in your trespass, meaning when you were dead in your sin, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning when you were spiritually alienated, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses and sin. Your slates have been wiped clean. I paraphrase verse 14. As a Christian, we do not willfully sin. It is not in your DNA 
to willfully, or I should say, should not be in your DNA to willfully sin. Cannot, cannot be, should not be, should not be. Because we're of God, we shouldn't be. As a Christian, remember we define a Christian as an adherent follower of God. We, 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 we as a Christian, we still sin. Why? Because, because we're still in, our, in, our, in, in, in this body, in the flesh. We may, do so in t we may do so intentionally. Some of us are unintentionally. And if we go out and we unintentionally, we continue and we continue, then we do not know God. Because the moment you do it, the Holy Spirit should speak to you and you want to, to run back. You want to repent. You want to come back. You want to come back. Sin is not the Christian lifestyle. It's not the Christian lifestyle. Some people go to church. Does that mean they're a Christian? Because they practice sin day and night. And if you practice sin day and night, you're not a Christian. You're a fake. Scripture says, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Some translations say, God forbid. How shall we who die to sin live in it any longer? You cannot practice sin and be a child of God. You cannot use to love palm readers and you're a child of God and you still want your palm to be read. You cannot. You cannot love hustling and when I say hustling, I'm talking about negative connotation. And as a child of God, you still want to hustle. There's no such thing. There's no, you cannot have one foot in and one foot out. You cannot do it. It is impossible. Scripture says if you do not, you do not know him. You do not know him. So, do Christians sin? Yes. Why is it that a Christian sin? Why would any Christian sin? One, because we are still alive and we still have that DNA of sin within us. We still have it. Two, maybe you to our anger. Sometimes it may get the better of us. That's why the scripture was careful in telling us to be angry and sin not. Because, because some of us do. Two, it may be due to our emotion. Three, or, or, or it may be due to deception. Four, it can be due to us being immature in the faith. But remember this, once you are a Christian, your mind must be renewed, be transformed. The scripture says, by the renewing of your mind. And renewal takes the time. Now, some of us may just go astray. To sin, and that sinful deed may grieve the Holy Spirit so much that the Holy Spirit does depart from us. And some of us may just go astray, and uh, we have to get a great spanking. We have to get beat up to come back in. But not because you may be beaten up by the Holy Spirit. Beaten up. Not because God may allow you to be beaten up. He means he doesn't love you. When you love your child and your child goes wrong, you punish them. I don't mean abuse the child. Let me be very clear. I don't mean abuse the child. I don't mean um, slap them up the head and this and hit them with a big rock and all those stuff, you know. You don't do those barbaric things. You don't do those things. Punishment does not connotate tying them to the radiator or doing those wicked deeds. Maybe just as simple as you're not getting that. Go and go and sit down over there. No. None of that today. No. Oh, you like, you want to go to that party? No. You withhold from them. But some of us, you may fall, you may sin, and you may get a big beat up. Some of you may be in the act of the fornication and all of those stuff. You may just get an STI. 
Some of you may go out and do some stuff and, and, and backslide. You may just get your hand cut off when you're sticking it through someone's window. But I want you to tell you this. Once you come back, don't blame God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Tell me what. If you don't, ch what does the scripture say? You spare the rod and spoil the child. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you are without. So don't think that, oh, I'm doing it and I'm getting away with it. No, 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 no. If you go astray, God may just punish you and bring you back to him. And those who claim not to sin, those who claim not to sin, I say go back and read the scripture. I did not say anything of my own here tonight. I was very careful in quoting the scripture, telling you exactly where to look, how to find it, flip your Bibles, those who are so holy, listen to this, Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. Not, 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 just, not just the people sitting on the bench. Not just um, the guy out on the corner. Not just who is better, I'm better than him. Not none of those stuff. All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. All of us. All of us. So, listen my brothers and sisters. Do Christians sin? Yeah, but not willfully. So, do not, do not be disheartened if you fell. Get up. Brush yourself off. Repent. Come back into fellowship. Don't let them keep you down. Don't let them deceive you to keep you out. Those of you who have gone astray, you need to repent and come back. We're still alive. Repentance is still available. Do so now. In Jesus' name, amen.